we're going to look first at something we have in our confessions. Uh, I'm hoping we get the confessional text up first. From Belgic Confession, Article 23, where it talks about our righteousness before God. And then we'll go to God's Word. We'll, we'll see where these truths come from, in part from Philippians chapter 3. So first, here is uh, something we confess and believe uh, as a church. This is regarding our righteousness before God. We believe that our blessedness lies in the forgiveness of our sins for Jesus Christ's sake. And that therein our righteousness before God consists, as David and Paul teach us. They speak of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. The apostle also says that we are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Therefore, we always hold to this firm foundation. We give all the glory to God, humble ourselves before him, and acknowledge ourselves to be what we are. We do not claim anything for ourselves or our merits, but rely and rest on the only obedience of Jesus Christ crucified. His obedience is ours when we believe in him. This is sufficient to cover all our iniquities or sins and to give us confidence in drawing near to God, freeing our conscience of fear, terror, and dread so that we do not follow the example of our first father, Adam, who trembling tried to hide and covered himself with fig leaves. For if indeed if we had to appear before God, relying, be it ever so little, on ourselves, or some other creature, woe be to us. We would be consumed. Therefore, everyone must say with David, O Lord, enter not into judgment with your servant, for no one living is righteous before you. That's what we confess. We draw those truths, beloved, from many parts of God's word, from one part in particular, Philippians chapter 3. We'll read right now the first 14 verses that says this. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. As to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection, and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. 
Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. We'll stop reading there. What do we learn from these words that we have just read? What we see more than anything is that for Paul, Christ was at the center of everything. It was in Christ that he had hope. It was because of what Jesus Christ had done that he was willing to face any kinds of trials or difficulties or tribulation. His primary goal in life was to gain Christ, be found in him. His life goal was more and more to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. And the same ought to be true for all of us. Knowing Christ Jesus more and more over the course of our lives. Being fixed on him needs to be number one. You know, Paul, he didn't write these words that we have in in Philippians chapter 3 so that the Philippians or or us today would go, oh, that's nice, Paul. You you have your your focus on Jesus Christ. Meanwhile, I'm going to be over here focusing on the things that I want to do or I think are important. No, Paul spoke of his Christ-centered life, of all his hopes and dreams and expectations for the future being wrapped up in Jesus Christ so that the Philippians, so that we, believers today, would learn from that example and imitate him. If you keep reading in Philippians chapter 3, you'll read this. Paul will say, let those of us who are mature Think this way. Christ-centered Christianity is not, you know, elementary Christianity. And and once you know a bit about Christ, well, then you can go on and, you know, study the other aspects of the faith. No, the mature Christian is one whose eyes are constantly focused on Christ. And yes, knows more than just Christ. But never lose this track of what's of first importance. It says, if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Which is really Paul saying, if you think otherwise, well, give it time. God will show you the truth of the matter. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. If you want an idea of what a mature Christian looks like, find a brother or sister in Christ who won't shut up about Jesus Christ who loves to talk about Christ, who loves to bring your focus and attention back to Christ, your Savior. That is a good model for you, a good model for all of us. Because, you know, as Christians, sometimes we confuse being a Christian with knowing Christ. We confuse what Christians look like with what Christ looks like and what Christ has done. There's many a Christian who thought they were mature in the faith because they knew all the rules and the expectations which were laid out in their churches and they were pretty good at following them. 
Well, here's the thing. You can know how to be a perfect Christian as far as other people in your church are concerned or what they see. And still not know Christ. There has been many a Christian believer, sometimes, you know, mature Christian believers, you know, those who had the offices of pastor, elder, or deacon, who knew all sorts of things about the Christian life and what it looked like and could teach that to others. But then it gets revealed that they have been living a double life. That behind the outer person, there is a, a man who abuses his wife. An office bearer guilty of adultery. A person whose life is characterized far more by greed and desire for money than it is by generosity and desire for godliness. And you can say, how can that be? It's because knowing how to be a Christian is not the same thing as knowing Jesus Christ who gave his life for us. Knowing Christ involves far more than knowing what a Christian kind of looks like in our culture, acts like in our church. Knowing Christ involves you seeking your salvation completely in the Son of God. It involves us all recognizing that we have done things which should earn us judgment and damnation, but Jesus Christ has come along and claimed us and saved us and rescued us from all that because of his own love, because he's chosen to do it, not because of our performance, our worthiness. Knowing Christ know, involves knowing not only that Jesus Christ has, has saved sinners in some abstract grouping of people, but Jesus Christ has saved you. On that cross, he bled and died for your salvation, knowing his sheep, knowing each and every person who might be his, who might put their trust in him. Knowing Christ means you know that someone else has done it all. You can be at ease. I'm not saying the Christian life will be easy. But I'm saying you get to rest in him. And yes, he calls you to, to follow him, to heed his commands. But you're always just doing that out of gratitude, knowing that the big important things have been accomplished. And what you're doing is just about celebration and thankfulness, not about achievement or earning or meriting anything. It is surprisingly easy to be a Christian without really thinking of Christ. You ever notice that? You know, over the course of my lifetime, I have been a part of hundreds of conversations in which people were talking about whether or not, you know, this or that behavior was acceptable for Christians. You know, can we watch, you know, this kind of movie or that kind of movie? You know, what exactly is, is going too far physically look like in a dating relationship for two Christians? What does modesty look like for the Christian? What does generosity and charity look like for the Christian? I've seen many of those conversations, been a part of many of those conversations, where we talked all about the outward behavior, but often sadly failed to talk about Christ. To talk about the motivation for why we might want to live differently. 
and how that living differently is not the thing that saves us. And I've listened to sermons and I've delivered a few, to my regret, in which all kinds of practical details of the Christian life were discussed or, or different Christian doctrines were covered, but precious little was being said about Jesus Christ and how he is at the center of it all. And in him we have the whole reason behind all that we're doing as believers. And I get it. You know, Christians, generally speaking, you know, go out into the world, talk to other people who call themselves Christians, you'll find we generally agree on the whole Jesus Christ is our Savior thing. Now, if you didn't accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, or have at least some idea of him saving you, you're probably not going to think of yourself as a Christian follower of Jesus Christ. And so as a result, we don't always feel a need to focus that much on how exactly Christ has saved us, or the fact that he has saved us, or how unworthy we are of the fact that he's saved us. Now it's easy for us to just kind of talk about Jesus being our righteousness, or Jesus making us righteous, and we pass on that lingo to, to our children, to young believers, or, or to new believers who join us in the church, without really thinking about what it means. How many of you, if I was to put you on the spot right now, was like, what exactly does righteousness mean? What exactly does justification mean? How many of you are going to be like, pick me, I got it down. And we need to take time to remember, reflect on such things. To treasure that, that we are righteous. That is to say we are right with God. Innocent before him. For Jesus Christ's sake. Solely because of what he has done. You know, Paul, he would write in Romans 3, verse 24. And all are justified, which is to say made righteous, made innocent. Freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. It is because of Christ Jesus that we are God's children, that we can use that language. It's because of Christ Jesus that despite the fact that in our daily lives we mess up in all sorts of ways and hurt people around us constantly and regularly fail to, to be the kind of people that God wants us to be, that nevertheless we can look forward to eternal life beginning now, ending never. Now, don't get me wrong, it is good to talk about how to live a Christian life. It is good to look at what the Bible teaches about, about all sorts of things. But in everything we're living and teaching, Jesus must be at the center or the foundation, at the core of it all. Because generous giving or the ability to present a magnificent biblical defense of infant baptism will not save you. But knowing Jesus will. The person who believes in Jesus, who trusts in Jesus, who follows Jesus, they don't just know an interesting person from human history. They don't just get an interesting example of sacrificial living, or what love looks like. Now we are told there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans 8.1 If anyone is in Christ, a new creation has come. 2 Corinthians 5 In Christ Jesus we have our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. 1 Corinthians 1 
King David would once write in Psalm 32, Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them, and in whose spirit is no deceit. When you know Jesus, you are blessed in that way. Your transgressions are forgiven. Your sins covered or atoned for. Not counted against you. Because you are united by faith with someone who has already paid for those sins and transgressions. Faith unites you to the one who has paid all debts, fulfilled all obligations, been all that God might want a person to be. In Christ, we have everything necessary that we might know the God who has made us and given us life. That we might not only know him, but enjoy him, be a part of his family, live in the comfort that he is controlling all things for our eternal good. Knowing Jesus Christ, recognizing that he has done it all for us. That's where we need to always start. Now, Christianity is, in many ways, a very fractured religion. There are numerous churches, numerous denominations around us. And all the different denominations have slightly different practices, slightly different doctrines. But as a result, it can be very tempting for us to spend our time you know, focusing on, on what sets you know, our church apart from other churches. But in that, we need to be careful. We need to be careful that our primary focus is on the things that are of primary importance to our salvation. Now, simply because a topic like infant baptism can be a contentious one. You might have many Baptist neighbors. Doesn't mean your primary focus on life should be on the infant adult baptism or more accurately, the credo, pedo, baptism discussion. Simply because that church over there might teach a different perspective on, on the Christian Sunday, and to what degree it is the Christian Sabbath, doesn't mean the, the first thing we should be focused upon is what we do on the Lord's Day. Oh, it can be. Many a Christian young person has grown up knowing all about what separated their church from the church next door or down the road while knowing precious little of Jesus Christ, or at least having precious little appreciation for Jesus Christ. But I tell you the most important thing we can ever talk about and address whether that be with one another or our neighbors around us or anyone we come across, is that good news that Jesus Christ gave his life for the complete forgiveness of all our sins. The most beautiful thing we can talk about is how we get to share in Jesus Christ's resurrection from the dead. And that inspires us to want to live a new kind of life. But unfortunately, the reality is that some of us have spent very little time talking about such things, whether with our kids, our neighbors, our friends. Many have grown up in the church knowing how to live as Christians. Knowing the Christian doctrines. But not possessing true Christian joy. Or confidence. 
that Jesus Christ was their Lord and Savior. Because while their parents and their teachers so often talked about what made them different than the Roman Catholics or what made them different than the Pentecostals or why they did things in their household in this way as opposed to that way, they perhaps forgot to talk to their children about their love for Jesus Christ and how in Jesus Christ they have a Savior who gives them hope and joy and how their faith is in no way about their performance, but it's all about the amazing things God has graciously done. And I'm not saying that's true of all of you. Perhaps some of you have had you know, parents or other spiritual mentors in your life who are willing to open up about their faith and who are willing to talk about their faith in a very Christ-focused kind of way. But I know there are too many where that is not the case. That we need to know Christ. We ought to want to know the one who is our righteousness. We ought to want to know the one who has saved us from our sins. We ought to want to passionately seek him, know him, love him, honor him. See him as our all in all. We ought to rattle off the different names of Jesus like that. We ought to point to countless texts which are speaking to him and testify to the amazing things that he would and has done. And so often we are prepared for so many other theological debates I know only the very least about Christ. No, Paul, he tells us in Philippians 3, 3 to 4. For it is we who are the circumcision, that is saying, we who are the true children of God. We who serve God by his spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus and who put no confidence in the flesh. That sadly, even in our very reformed churches where we like to emphasize that, that God has done it. It's by his grace, his power. There are mature believers who will say, yeah, but I'm not sure if I'm saved. Because I still see these and those sins going on in my life. It's like, are you not paying attention to the doctrine, Beloved. Saved by Christ alone. The good works, all the things we're called to do, that is mere response to salvation. That is not contributing to it. That is not making it a reality. It is not Christ has first done his part, and now you will do your part. It is Christ has done his part. And that was the only part that was required. So rejoice in that. Give thanks. Follow after him? Absolutely. But not following as someone who worries that Christ is going to turn that around one day and be like, you weren't good enough, you didn't perform hard enough, see ya. But following him as someone who knows of his love, and the boundless nature of his kindness and his generosity. Knowing that Christ has done it all, and it's not now on us. I love how Paul goes on in Philippians 3 to talk about the fact that, though I myself have, have reasons for such confidence. And Paul says, you know, if there's anyone who has reasons for confidence in their performance or the things they have done, it's me. If someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh. I have more, Paul says. By flesh there, Paul basically means anything that we are, anything we might do. And Paul presents us with a, an amazing resume. His background is his personal accomplishments. Noting he was circumcised on the eighth day, 
as Moses commanded. Of the people of Israel, that is, of God's people. Of the tribe of Benjamin, one of the 12 tribes that God would deliver out of slavery in Egypt and claim for himself and bring into his covenant. A Hebrews of Hebrews, which is kind of a Hebrew way of saying the most Hebrew Hebrew you might ever meet. As to the law, a Pharisee. And I know a lot of us, we hear the word Pharisee and we think bad guys. But back then, Pharisee basically meant extremely devoted to keeping the law, rigorous. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. There was no end to the lengths he would go. As to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. He did all those things that might be expected of him. He said nothing, none of that compares to just knowing Christ. Knowing Christ is better than having had that life of perfect performance and fulfilling all the check boxes and expectations that someone might have. And perhaps it's healthy for all of us to do our own version of Paul's dramatic statements, to recognize clearly and explicitly that the things we are and have done are not what secure us salvation. Now, what could you put your confidence in? Years of faithful church attendance? Your baptism? Your profession of faith? The, the hours that come? Or the knowledge that you've gained over the years? Regular donations to charitable causes? Hours volunteered at local community kitchens? Building homes for those in need of shelter? Whatever it is, it's garbage compared to knowing Christ. Not one of those things will save you or contribute in the least to your salvation. Christ has done it all. I was baptized as an infant in the Canadian Reformed Church. I was taught in the elementary and high schools Reformed Christian schools. I was catechized for half a decade before making my profession of faith. I attended four years of seminary, elected, ordained as a pastor in these churches. It is garbage compared to knowing Christ. Not one of those things will wipe away a single one of my sins. Not one of those things has brought me one iota, one centimeter closer to my God. Knowing Christ is the whole thing. Believing in him. Trusting that he did indeed die for my sins, die to claim me as a child of God. That is the only thing that will matter at all as I stand before the judgment seat of my God and maker in the end. Paul would write, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. In the ESV, it says, For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ. I like how the NIV translated this. I consider them garbage, because I think that makes it a bit clearer, that I may know Christ. The things we do are not what save. They are not what make us righteous. I 
I think it is true of many of us that we need to stop looking so much at ourselves and instead focus more in our daily lives on what Jesus Christ has done. Our Christian faith, being a Christian, isn't just knowing Christ, but it needs to begin there. It needs to start there. Our actions, our conduct, our very way of thinking needs to flow out of the sure confidence that Jesus Christ alone is our righteousness. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we pray that you would help each and every one of us to know Jesus Christ, your Son. We pray that you would help each and every one of us to recognize that we are sinners who do not deserve to be your people. And we pray that you will help each and every one of us to recognize that despite that reality and that truth, we can be your people through Christ, your Son. We are saved, redeemed, justified. Not because of our works. Not because of our faithfulness to your standards, but because of Christ's faithfulness to those standards. Because Christ has done everything you might ask. And Christ now shares his righteousness with us. Father, we thank you for the faith which connects us to Jesus Christ, which enables for his righteousness to benefit us. We thank you for the Holy Spirit who lives in our hearts, who reminds us of the things Christ did and said, who helps to renew us day by day that we might be more like Christ and might more and more look like you. We thank you for these things, Father, and we pray that we might treasure them. We pray that we might treasure the good news that we are saved because of what Jesus Christ alone has done. You know that we are often inclined to think that it is ultimately our actions, our activity, which secure our salvation. Help us to remember the inspired words of the Apostle Paul. Help us to remember that all of our works are like garbage compared to what Jesus Christ has done for us, in our place, for our benefit. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I invite you to stand, sing together. Yet not I, but through Christ in me.